Well, at first we we tried to hide it. We would never tell anybody outside because it would frighten customers away. Whether it affected the business, I don't think so. I don't think any had any much effect on the business at all in any way. It affected me. I saw things that I never ever expected to see in my life happening, and I am pretty skeptic about it all. There's got to be some somewhere. There's got to be an explanation because what I've witnessed, it's been fantastic. Um, I know there are, you know, horrible things do happen, but with us it was amazing. Um, it was happy. It brought a lot of happiness into the shop. I believe in God, and if there's a God, there's a ghost. David Fontana is Professor of Psychology at Cardiff University. He's also a very prominent figure in paranormal research in this country. Indeed, he is the current president of the Society for Psychical Research. He has become personally involved in one of the most remarkable series of paranormal activities ever to have occurred in this country. So I was privileged in this sense, in fact, to see so many things over such a long period of time. And even when I took a colleague of mine along so that we had two people watching what was happening, uh, she also was able to see a number of these phenomena. And we were quite certain that uh, there was no trickery involved. There was no question of this. These events have taken place in Cardiff over the past five or six years. And they involve a spirit, a presence, a persona, it's difficult to know what word to use, who seems to have a childlike, playful personality. Formerly, he is called the Cardiff Poltergeist, that is to say, a disembodied spirit. But to those who have come in contact with him, he is known affectionately as Pete. And they do seem to feel genuine affection for Pete. He is, if you like, the E.T. of the spirit world. Playful, mischievous, whimsical, friendly. One day, I think it was Ian, was standing at the bench and something hit him on the chest, if I remember right and dropped onto the floor. He picked it up and he just threw it back into one of the corners of the room. And immediately, a missile of some sort, I think it was the same thing, came straight back at him and hit the wall behind his head. So he looked at me and I looked at him and he, he picked up another missile and he just threw it back again. And instantly, back it came again. And this became a regular, he played with it then for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but this became a regular item. And many people threw stones into that corner or nuts and bolts. And nine times out of 10, they had something back. And John said to me, he said, oh, well, you let me know if you see anything odd or, um, you know, strange. So I said, right. Well, the next thing, as he said that, I heard ping, ping, and John looked at me, he said, that's the start of it. So I said, well, what is it? He said, well, believe it or not, he said, it's stones. I said, well, where's it coming from? He said, well, come into the workshop. And he said, I'll show you. He went to the workshop and he pointed at a certain part of the workshop and it was up in the corner. He said, throw, pick up a stone and throw it. Well, I picked up the stone and as I threw it, someone came hurling straight back at me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He said, what did I see? So he said, look on the wall. So I looked on the wall, and John had on a rack all these different sized spanners. He said, look at the spanners. One spanner was swinging back and forth, then the other would swing back and forth. And then before I realized, the whole lot was swinging back and forth. So I started laughing. I said, John, I said, we've got something strange in this place. He said, I know. He said, that's what I've been telling you. But he said, uh, for a long time, he said, it happened in the other building, but he said, I thought it was the boys fooling around. There was an office upstairs above us, and one day, a paper clip landed on the bench. So Richard picked it up, and he said, that's a bit mean, Pete. Have you got any more? With that, a whole box of paper clips landed on the fire. <coughs> Bang. Never bounced, and then it just bang. So we just look at one another, and then Richard says, what about some paper to go with it? And down behind us floats a sheet of paper. 
when we look at it, it's a stationary order. So I went and saw the chap upstairs, and I said, is this yours? He said, that's my stationary order. I made it out this morning. And I said, are these your box of clips? Well, he said, they're the same ones we use. So where they came from or how they got from his office to my workshop, I don't know. There are countless stories of Pete playing games like that, with anything lying around. He is obsessed with stones. Every day, and this went on for five years, almost every day, at one period of time, you could ask for money. Just give us money, Pete, and pennies, two pence pieces, five pence pieces, and pound coins on occasions used to come. Never 50 pence, I don't know why. Um, Mainly pennies and two pennies. And in one hour, we I collected 68 pence in an hour, just saying, send me some more money, send me some more money. And it would appear from nowhere, just dropping all around you, different parts of the workshop. Now, we've been here two years, and on average, we're getting about five pound a month in pound coins. That's an average, mind. Sometimes it could be more, sometimes it could be less. Now, the last time that we ever had anything was yesterday. I remember once I was drinking a cup of tea after washing the dishes, and I'm looking out the window, and there's a pound coin in my cup. Flop. And the noise on the cup, and my wife said, What's that? I said, Oh, we're rich again. Once Fred started getting this, this money, you know, money was being planted on his windscreen, and he was finding money, we all felt, you know, why should Fred be the only one that gets the money? You know, we, we only get pennies, and Fred gets fivers, sort of thing. And uh, so... We found that whatever journey we took, I mean, there was a bookmaker just around the corner, and from time to time people would pop around there and perhaps have a bet. And there was a television in the canteen where they could watch the race, like, you know. And uh, we would walk around to the bookies and perhaps catch up with Fred and talk to him on the way back. And we were all looking on the floor as we went around, you know, and not finding anything at all. And then suddenly on the way back, Fred would say, Oh, look at that, you know. And there'd be a fiver leaning up against the wall, you know. And we all, you know, why is it Fred? You know, we just looked there and there was nothing there. And then Fred looks there and, and there it is, you know. Pete, it seems, even liked to play with children's toys, sometimes with destructive results. We were talking to one of our customers and the next day she brought in a U Rubik cube and some other toys. Uh, one of the items actually was an action man. And the next day we put him on the, she said, let him play with these. So we put him on a shelf for him to play with. And the next day we came in and the action man, the head was ripped off and it was all in pieces on the floor. The Rubik cube. It used to love the Rubik Cube. You never actually saw it happen, you know, but we put it up in the corner and uh, one of the reps would be there and we'd say, right, no, we'll have a go at the Rubik Cube, see if we could do it ourselves first. Not one of us could do it. So then we had a, like a code, you know, B for blue and so forth, like, you know. And then we'd be in the coffee room, having a cup of coffee, and we'd message all up, and within seconds, we'd, somebody would look, and it would be all done. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And we then decided to uh, write down the sequence of the nine facing squares, uh, B for blue, O for orange, R for red, G for green, that sort of thing, and write down the sequence. And because there was a sort of pile of lawn mowers that were sort of stretched out across that anyone would physically have to climb over to get to this Rubik Cube, it would take someone quite a time to do it. Um, but every time we changed this sequence, it would always finish up with blue, orange, yellow across the top, which we interpret as B-O-Y, boy. But what is quite remarkable are the kinds of expression that people use who have had encounters with Pete. There is profound affection, even love. It's almost as if he's become a household pet. I used to write to it. And uh, I used to ask, we named it Pete. Why? I don't know. It just Pete came to our heads, you know. So I used to write to it every day. I used to write on a bit of paper, ask its name. Is it John? Is it, you know, Alan and so forth? And I would leave it till the following morning. When I'd come in, there'd be no written right across the page. I even asked it to do my football coupon one week. 
<laughs> and there were all these big crosses all the way down. Couldn't send it because it was a ch like a child, you know. I remember once I was doing the washing up. I, I do the washing up in my house, believe it or not. My wife does the polishing, the ironing. I, I do the washing up. And I'm washing the dishes and looking out through the front window, which looks down the street. I come to the last plate, as you might say. Wash that, and my hands are soaking wet. And splash is an orange. Come from nowhere, straight into the bowl of water, and covered from head to foot in soap suds. Now, we cannot have an orange in our house. Pete, as we call him, doesn't like oranges. You have tangerines, apples, pears, bananas, anything. But an orange, no. A disembodied spirit, a poltergeist that people love, is pretty weird. But what has to be weirdest of all is that this disembodied spirit appears to have intelligence. It can learn and adapt to changes in its environment. Another feature of this case was that the poltergeist, for want of a better term, appeared to be intelligent and to actually respond to requests for various different objects. In fact, John said that sometimes it could find things like spanners and screwdrivers quicker than he could in the workshop. He would ask for them and just clatter on the workbench beside him. One particular day I thought, we'll see how intelligent it is. And I picked up a stone and threw it into the corner and I did get one straight back. Then at another, I tried another stone and I pretended to throw the stone and I didn't throw it and it came back. But the next time I did again, pretended to throw it and it never threw. So it learned from that slight little test that it did learn from what was going on there. Over the, the years that we were there, playing, as I say playing, because we used to play with it, you know, we used to say, Pete throws a pound, a coin, whatever. And we found that he was very intelligent. You know, if you wanted a plug, you know, we would say a plug, electric plug, that you plug an oil in, something like that. He'd throw your spark plug. In other words, he would associate a plug as being a spark plug. And it was amazing. He'd throw you anything you asked for, really. We must make a note of this. He'd throw you a pen. Silly things, you know, or stop messing about, Pete. We've uh, we got to get this together. And he'd throw you a staple. You know, this sort of thing he would associate with what we were speaking. It was so good. I said, right, Peter, I said, uh, you're so clever. I said, there's one thing you can't do or get from me. I said, and that's a Rolls Royce. And as I said that, at my feet, and John was my witness, a Rolls Royce key ring landed at my feet with RR on it. Pete, the playful poltergeist, first made his presence felt in, of all places, a lawnmower repair shop in a shed in Cardiff. At one stage, Pete became totally addicted to these little lawnmower carburetor floats. He just couldn't resist playing all kinds of tricks with them. Well, he went through a period of floats. Floats like this used to appear and disappear. You'd put them down on a, on a, a surface and 10 minutes, they'd be gone. And you usually find them stuck up in the ceiling or they come back. And then, so we started playing with them and putting them in certain positions. One particular day, as we were locking up, we put one in a position where we could all see it to see if it would be gone the next morning when we came in. And we locked the door, got in the car, all of us, and went up the road. We stopped at a shop for one of the chaps to get some cigarettes, Fred. He went in the shop, and as he came out, he was as white as a sheet. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, look, and he opened his hand, and there was change in there, money, and a float like that. And he said, it's got to be the one from the shop. So I said, no, I don't think so. So he said, let's go back and check. We went back and checked and we opened the shop and we pushed the door and there's nothing where the float was when we left it. Only a matter of 10 minutes earlier. And this one morning, um, I noticed it first actually, we went in and I happened to look up at the ceiling 
And I thought, what's that stuck in the ceiling? And there is no way, because we had people trying to do it, there was no way you could push that into the ceiling tiles. And we took it down, there was a five pound note, all screwed up, stuck on the end and then stuck in the ceiling. Well, we had this for a week, so it got that we had a bit of fun with it, because we say, who's turn next? My wife and I locked up the shop about five o'clock one evening, a beautiful summer's evening, and we drove home all. Got so far, and I said, we must get some grub, because we're hungry. So we called into Safeways on the Cowboys Road in Cardiff. And I was a bit black with dirt from repairing lawnmowers. And I'm sat in the car, and I'm tapping the wheel of the, the car, steering wheel, to the music. And with that, there's a chap next to me, and he's doing the same, because he must have the same music on. Now, my window is open on my side, and my wife goes into Safeways to buy some food. And then I look up into the sky, and there's this black mass. It was something like a black piece of rag coming towards me. And it came through my window, hit the passenger window, my window was open, and just five different floats all on the floor of the car. Um, I'd made a sponge. The same thing happened to my sister-in-law this one Sunday. And John was talking about lawnmowers and so forth. And uh, I couldn't believe it. And on the table, I made the sponge. It was on the cake stand and everything. And when I turned around, there was a carburetor float stuck in the middle of it. <laughs> and the same thing had happened to my sister-in-law. So she had the same experience. And floats became the um, order of the day for this thing to play with. And it just played around till it got tired of them. And in the end... It went on to something else, usually keys or some, some, something different. It changed its whole thing and it said, fed up with that, let's go on to something else. Nowadays it seems that Peter's moved in with John's brother-in-law, Fred, who also used to work in the lawnmower repair shop. Fred is now retired and he is the only person who claims actually to have seen Pete. Now he was a, a little boy dressed in 1940s clothes. And no figure or face. You, you could see the outline, and he had a sort of a cub cap on his head. And you could see the outline of his hands, his face, and yet you couldn't put a face to him. But he was sat on sort of a fixture where we kept spare parts for lawnmowers. No, he looked out of proportion to me. His body, compared to his size... His head should have been in the ceiling. It's hard to explain, but he, he looked really out of proportion. Now, this happened several times. I should say four or five times I've seen Pete the Poltergeist. Now, I remember once when John was doing a lawnmower, when I say doing it, doing the engine of a lawnmower, and there was a nut that he could not get undone. So he said, come over here, Fred, give us a hand. So I held the lawnmower while he was giving, getting the old spanner on it and really trying to get this nut undone. And I said, don't look up now, John, but Pete is behind you on the shelf. With that, John slowly went back to look, and it must have been a half a hoose brick. Just come down and it just smashed on the lawnmower. It frightened us. In fact, we went outside for a smoke afterwards. It was that frightening. Another time, I was locking up the shop, and Pete was in our little canteen where we used to have cups of tea. And he was waving to me, just one hand up. No hand, but you could tell he was waving because the sleeve was moving. And I was walking slowly because I was on my own and I was frightened. And I said, come on now, Pete, I've got to go home. And he just vanished, vanished completely. As we have seen, this story totally defies rational explanation. It leaves us with some stark choices. Either we disbelieve the range of witnesses, or we have some immensely complex questions to answer. Science doesn't have a great deal to say to help us. 
Science is very powerful, very accurate, very precise within its own areas of definition. But there are mysteries in the world still. There are things we don't understand, and the good scientist keeps an open mind on these, explores them, and then tries to draw some kind of conclusions from them. Science, in a sense, has been found wanting, although I have to say that, in a sense, most scientists have not even considered whether paranormal phenomena exist or not. They have simply assumed it doesn't. And their opinions, in fact, are worthless. They have not studied the subject. But even when those scientists who have done so have spent decades studying it, like Professor William James or Professor Sir Oliver Lodge, their understanding has been very, very limited. And it could be, you see, that the 21st century, if our civilization survives, and if there are still scientists around, it may be that they will have to realize that the understanding of human personality in its non-physical material aspects is totally beyond our understanding, beyond the methods of science as it operates now. That doesn't mean that there will not be an answer but it'll be something that we cannot envisage now. But then, the beginning of the 20th century, everything in physics, in a sense, had to be rethought because of Einstein and Beckel and radioactivity and relativity and quantum mechanics. So science is struggling to grapple with issues and phenomena which it really is not yet equipped to tackle. It isn't that science can reject them, or prove them to be irrational. A childlike, intelligent, playful poltergeist is simply beyond the bounds of scientific competence. But there is no denying the response of people who claim to have interacted with it. They believe they're interacting with an essentially human spirit. I, I realized that I was seeing something that was... something that other people would never be able to see. And for a while, I felt very privileged, and then later on, we became very blasé about it, and I think by the time it went, I was glad to see it go, and I don't think I'd like to see him back. I'm one of these people, I never ever believe in anything, ever. I'm, you know, you've got to see things to actually believe it. But after what I've witnessed, I don't, you know, I feel honoured. I find that when you talk about it, things happen. Now, you could go away after making this program, and I can be inundated with pound coins, even a fiver, tenner, whatever. Whatever Pete decides to give me, he will give me, which is uncanny. But I'm not sorry, I'm privileged. Mm -hmm.